It's my pleasure to be with you this morning and a greater pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. You'll get a preview of what will be presented tomorrow to the Women's Conference in Athens. And I do want to make sure that we make a plug for the Terry staff that brought the Professional Women's Conference together. They have been the engine behind making this go. And those of you who will be in attendance, either speaking or attending or have sent perhaps employees from your firm, I think you'll have a really great day, a great investment of their time and, uh, and your commitment to Terry. So I want to take an opportunity to introduce Alice Lusk. Alice is also a Terry grad, has an MBA from the University of Georgia, but she has a very distinguished career. And rather than go through those details, she's asked that she share those with you in her discussion this morning. It's a great pleasure to introduce Alice to you as a successful executive and a graduate of the University of Georgia. I think you'll take away some key points from her success, her experience, and we'll look forward to sharing those with you. Thank you. Now, I'm assu assuming my mic is on. Magically happened. Uh, I apologize to start with a couple of days ago. I came down with a sinus infection and I sound kind of scratchy, so uh, I'm hoping I don't get a coughing a spell, but I have lozenges right here and a glass of water. Uh, what I wanted to do this morning is I wanted to go through uh, what the research has shown as quickly as I can, and I just realized I'm color coordinated with my presentation. Uh, <laughs> But I really, uh, hopefully, will have time for you to ask questions, and I'm hoping you will ask questions. And if no one does, my two friends from EDS, Talitha, <laughs> uh, back there, is, is uh, going to be on the hook for uh, asking questions. But um, one of the subjects that I've been interested in, I guess all the way back to when I was in graduate school, was what are the differences between men and women in business? Now, when I was in graduate school, um, I think there were like three, four women, and all the rest were men. And um, you know, it was it wasn't we didn't have really any opportunity to show any differences. To be successful, you had to participate and, and uh, think and act like men. Um, but through my out my business career and in leaving Georgia, I went to work for EDS. And for some of you who are too young to know Ross Perot. Uh, he was the founder of EDS, and during that period of time, he, EDS was comparable to Apple or Google or f Facebook. Uh, it was a brand new industry that he created, and uh, it was an exciting entrepreneurial company. And he ran out of the ability to hire junior military officers because the Vietnam War was over and no one was uh, really going back into the military. So he decided to have make an experiment and see if women were capable of learning how to code and learning how to operate in business. And I happen to be one of the experiments. Uh, another one who is an experiment is a graduate from the University of Florida, Martha Ward, who just retired this year. And um, I guess we started the whole process. Uh, in fact, I think now there are probably more women than there are men. But one of the things that I learned at EDS at a very early point in time is that business is gender neutral. To make money, it doesn't require you to be either a male or female. And one of the wonderful things about EDS during that period of time is I tell people, I don't think Ross would have cared if I was a purple person, as long as I was able to bring in new clients, bring money, et cetera. And as soon as possible, at the earliest stage in your career, he gave you responsibility for P&L. We never had a human resources department. We never had a legal department. We never had anything. You, as a business leader, were responsible for finding the people to make you successful. And so people became the lifeblood of your success. And because of that, you learned leadership skills very, very quickly. And you learned very quickly sales skills of how to find the best and how to put together teams. Because in the technology business, you know, it wasn't a single line process. It required a lot of different capabilities to service a given client in a variety of ways. Um, and from that experience, and then as I moved into research after I left EDS, 
one of the things that became very, very clear to me is that there are really significant cultural differences in companies, both in what industry they're in, what stage of their life cycle they're in, and knowing where you fit in is really the critical piece, not just for your success, but more importantly, for you to be very happy in life and, and in your job. Now, granted, EDS was at one extreme, man's man world, all military. Very, very uh, black and white thinking. The other extreme, a woman's woman's world, would probably be someone like Susan G. Coleman, a not-for-profit, pretty much totally run by women, and a different culture is created. There's a distinct difference between a for-profit and a not-for-profit, and a very different, big difference between an entrepreneurial company and a service company. And when I talk about a service company, I don't mean service in the way we've now defined it, but in terms of service, whether it's a, um, a service profession, nursing, uh, teaching. So there's a very distinct differences there in, in the personalities. Um, I had, toward the end of my business career at EDS, a major aha experience. Uh, I met a gentleman uh, called Dr. Robert Smith. He in introduced me to a methodology of evaluating business thinking. And so I volunteered myself and my group. And he came back and he said, now I understand why you are so successful at EDS. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when I looked at your business thinking patterns, very, very seldom do I see this in, in men, let alone women. And that is you have an extremely high, high ability on all three measures of, bis of business thinking. And so I said, okay, explain more to me about how you figure this out. And he then told me about Dr. Robert Hartman, who was a professor at the University of Tennessee. He escaped Nazi Germany. Uh, he was Jewish and he spent the rest of his life developing a methodology called value sciences where he wanted to scientifically be able to document how you think. And as a result of that, I then met Dr. Mark Moore, who was Dr. Hartman's PhD student. And between the two of us, um, we, our brains were going full time. And so we really started doing a lot of research uh, on the basis of, of what Dr. Hartman had done. He basically said, why can't we measure uh, decision-making capabilities in a scientific way in the same way that you measure physics or geometry or any of the other physical sciences? And he developed the science of ax axiology, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's boring. And, uh, <laughs> but most importantly is uh, my family background was we have a really strong history of, of uh, illness related to the heart. And yet, there are all kinds of diagnostic tools which my doctor very early said, oh, since your mother passed away and your sister and your brother and your dad, you know, we really need to make sure we stay on top of your cholesterol, your blood pressure, etc." And once you have those measurements, you have a choice, obviously, to figure out you want to change your lifestyle so you no longer are at risk. Well, that was the concept behind what Mark and I decided we wanted to build was a similar diagnostic tool in how do we measure thinking patterns. And when we found out we were measuring thinking patterns, we started seeing a huge difference between men and women. And, from th and then from there, we moved specifically into testing executive women. Uh, very simply, this diagnostic tool measures thinking patterns on two different dimensions. The first one is how do you think externally? How do you think about business? And the other one is how do you think about yourself? And there's a hierarchy of thinking. Systemic thinking, which is the lowest level, which is black-white thinking, which is what EDS was very strong at, uh, which is, you know, your annual plan, etc. Very, very black-white thinking. I could use the word simplistic, but I won't. But uh, it, systemic thinking 
is very much a part of being a lawyer, being an accountant, etc. The next level up is called extrinsic thinking, and that is getting results. You a more com complex way of thinking about okay, how do I get from here to here? How do I what what decisions do I have to make to be able to accomplish and, and reach results? And the highest excuse me the highest level of thinking is intrinsic, and this is how do you think about people. Externally, it's how you think about people. Internally, it's how do you think about yourself. And uh, it, it's basically people thinking. Now, some industries, the emphasis is going to be on systemic thinking. Other industries, it will be more on uh, people thinking. But a lot of the industries that are people thinking businesses also need to have leaders who can think systemically as well as thinking about how to get results. And what I've discovered in my business experience, especially since I've been doing pro bono work for women-owned businesses, they are really high on thinking about their products and their people. It's like they have their child. And then I'll say, and who's going to buy this? Who's going to give you money for this? And they look at me and go, what? You're in business to make money, are you not? Hmm, good point. So what we did then is we, uh, and Mark is the, is the mathematics uh, wizard at this. He wrote some really, really sophisticated software to be able to analyze and then be able to, that we would be able to present the differences. And uh, so there are six different categories that we measured. And those are, are listed above. And here's the overall comparison. And as you will see, as you see, <clears throat> When a, the executive women, when we really started focusing on executive women, I mean, it just was unbelievable that we would see those kinds of results. And almost all the participants in the executive women category were women that I personally got to know, got involved with. They were CEOs. They were senior vice presidents. They were fairly high-level uh, business people, some small business owners. And when you look at their total scores, you see that their overall thinking, you know, is way above the norm. Now, when we start going into the detail, now, as I said earlier, there are the six dimensions. On business, it is um, intrinsic, extrinsic, and, and systemic, I'm sorry, and then self, same thing. And that's how the totals, the, the six uh, different ways I reflect it. Okay, now, if we look specifically at men versus, versus women versus executive women, I mean, it's, you know, that is, it was, it was really, really a statistically significant number, which Mark kept saying, this isn't right, Alice, I got to keep doing it over and over and over again. And of course, the results kept coming out that way. However, this was the other really big difference. Look at where executive women are when it comes to thinking about themselves. Self-esteem, how do they feel about themselves? And look at where, um, where the men are. And so we said we really want to dig into this and see what it is about women when they start thinking about themselves that causes them to not be successful. And we were like, well, what's the so what? They obviously have really strong business thinking skills, but are their self-thinking skills, the way they feel about themselves, is that inhibiting them from moving into senior leadership? Now, one of the reasons I was always interested in this because every year I would get a report from Catalyst, which is an organization that measures how many, what percent of women move into senior leadership positions. And the number was 5, 6%, 8%. I think now it's maybe 10 or 12%. The needle has never really moved that far. And so we're like, well, what is the reason behind that? So in the research, what we came up with is what we call, ended up calling the four Ps. Uh, these are four very specific uh, areas where women 
think differently, and these areas, when they think differently about themselves in a business setting, can really impact um, their performance. But on all of the next slides, I keep putting on the bottom, man's man's world, for-profit, entrepreneurial. The real key to the, our research after we got through with it, we really realized the power of the research is the most important thing you can do for yourself is to figure out where do you fit. If you're in a man's man's world and you're always around all these black and white systemic thinkers and you are really not happy every single day, moving into a different culture and a different environment can make a really big difference. Now let me quickly go through the four P's and explain the behavior patterns and see if you recognize that you do any of these. First of all is power. And you know, power is, is pretty straightforward, just like all of them are, but one of the things that was, um, you know, I observed in terms of working in a male environment and then I also observed working primarily with, with women, women are not that into power. And here's a really good example. One of, of the uh, boutiques that I've worked with and we've become really, really good friends has a very successful boutique in Dallas which is specifically creates uh, clothing for women over 50, which I'm a product of. <laughs> and she really wanted to grow her business. And I said, well, tell me about your um, commission schedule. And she said, I don't have one. I said, what? She said, I have everyone on salary. I said, well, why is that? Well, because they, the women get along so much better when they are all, they're not competing against each other. And I said, do you think you would get more business if you put them on commission? Well, probably, but I just don't like the environment, you know, when people are kind of come talking about each other, et cetera. And I thought, at first I just kind of laughed about it, and then I thought, you know, that really gets back to power. She did not, had never wanted to, and still to this day has a very difficult time letting her employee know, you know, the business is hers, and she's made the investment. She does not want to use power in any way. Men use a lot of these different characteristics to, um, that are important to them. I mean, who do you talk to? Who do you socialize with? Uh, who's your assistant? One of the first things I learned at EDS, the most important person in my life was my administrative assistant, the one who knew all the other administrative assistants and had a really good relationship with the ones. Uh, and the other people that I got to know really, really well were, and at EDS we called them the brown shirts, but they were the maintenance men and the lawn people, and they watch my back all the time. And so, again, power can be used in, in many different ways. Politics, this is one that everybody says, ah, no, there are no politics. Well, politics becomes really, really important when you get into uh, companies that are older, companies that have a lot of bureaucracy, academic institutions. <laughs> um, I, I kind of chuckle when everybody says, oh, Her Herman Cain can't possibly become president. You know, he's not had any political experience. And I'm like, he's had more political experience than most people have because politics in a corporate organization is very, 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 very powerful. And knowing who has the real power and who think they have real power is a really important differentiation. Personalization. This is one that I think, um, you know, is just really, really, when you internalize that, can really make you an extremely unhappy person. You know, I've sat in more business meetings and people, men, are just cussing each other up on one side and down the other, and you're stupid, and how could you possibly think of this? And they walk out the door and slap them on the back, you know, meet you, up, you know, at the club. I mean, they absolutely can be really, really, really hateful and negative, and it doesn't mean a thing. For most women, myself included, you just internalize all that. It's about me. I must be stupid, or I don't have any idea. 
etc. And so that then causes you to make decisions, potentially, um, that really don't support the basic um, ability to, to grow the business. Um, I took it out of this presentation because we'll talk about it tomorrow in more detail, but let's just, for example, say that you are given responsibility to negotiate a new contract or to negotiate with a company that's bringing legal action against you. If you really personalize all the negative things that they're going to say to you, your ability to ne negotiate the best possible deal for your company is, is very, very difficult. And perfectionism. I know none of us have this trait at all. Uh, but this is another really, really strong characteristic of, of successful women. And this was the one when I worked one-on-one -on -one with executive women that they all just quickly, this is, you know, every single day, whether it's at home, whether it's with my children, whether it's my family, whether it's in business, if I don't do everything right, I feel really bad about myself. Again. In a business environment where, remember, business is general neutral, it's about making money, there's no perfect way to go about to do that. And the more you beat yourself up and the more you hurt yourself, you know, the more, the less chance you have of being successful in, in that environment. So the question is, where do you fit? Who are you? I mean, do you recognize some of the four P's that, that you have those characteristics? Do you know what kind of environment you could, where, where you could place your company or your organization that you work for? And if there's a really strong mismatch, you need to change the organization. Um, one of the things that I've been saying for the last couple of years uh, was, you know, if I could go back to school again, what I would do is I'd go back, and I really, really am fascinated with neuroscience and neurobiology, um, and especially after working with Mark, you know, how does the brain work? And, um, and I was given my wish. My husband had a stroke two years ago, and I know more about neuroscience and neurobiology and everything about how the brain works than I probably would have gotten if I'd gone to med school. But one of the things that I really, really learned was after he had a stroke, he couldn't, his speech center was hit, his right arm, his whole right side, he had a choice as to whether or not he really wanted to actively participate in rehab or not. Nothing was going to happen. He couldn't just say, okay, I'm going to walk again. And of course, he's ex-military and ex-EDS, so he's walking and dancing and doing all those things. But what I learned, the, the amount of time and effort that it took him and takes him to go from not walking to walking is the same amount of effort it's going to take for you to fundamentally change who you are. You know, if you go to Amazon.com and look under the title Women Business Books, the titles are How to Be a Gutsy Woman, How to Break the Glass Ceiling, How to Do This. Your chances of rewiring your brain anytime soon, you know, are pretty slim. And so the reality is, who are you today? How do you think? How do you... Uh, you know, what are the situations that make you happy? And yes, if you, I have all of the four Ps, but the aha experience for me was, ah, now when I'm in an environment, ah, uh, that's politics. I, I now can see it. It's like walking into a room with the light turned off. The light comes on, the furniture still is in the same place, but now you're no longer stumbling over it. In the dark, you stumble over it. So knowledge is really the key, and the second thing is making the right decision for where you want to be. And through life's experiences, um, you know, you may get fired. And that may be one of the best learning experiences you have. If you don't personalize it and step back and say, okay, I mean, I've Periodically, my husband and I say, mm, the good Lord must have had a plan for this. We don't quite understand exactly what it is, but I'm sure there's, and we had to make a choice either to say, okay, 
we're not going to do anything or we're going to feel sorry for ourselves or how do we take this experience and build for the rest of our lives a whole new way of dealing in a handicapped world. And so that's really the key that came out in our research. Uh, at the time, we were still figuring out, is there a way we can really develop a mentoring or programs to really help women to overcome these things. But in the last couple of years, I've realized that's really not what we should focus on. What we should focus on is how do you think and where do you fit? And if, if you're in a business environment that's really, really focused on making money, then you need to be able to talk about P&Ls, uh, percent of market, all of those 24-7, because that's what business people talk about. If you don't like that environment, then there's a lot of other choices as well. And tomorrow we'll go into uh, more detail on some of these issues, particularly the language of business. But I wanted to give you a flavor of, of what we found and hopefully have each one of you have some in, give you some insight as to why you're such a truly wonderful person. Now, are there any questions? Surely there are questions. And uh, let me just say that uh, we are recording this for a, a, a broadcast on our website. So please, um, if you've got a question, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. And that way, your question will be uh, recorded as well. And it's also a big room, so it makes it easier for people to hear you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. This, my question is very simple, and it refers to one of the charts where you have men, women, and executive men, women. What about executive men? They're average. <laughs> <laughs> They're no different. <laughs> no, I mean, that was really, really interesting. I mean, uh, Mark is also a statistician, and so I was really curious as to how many people did we have to make a stati statistically accurate information. And we ended up with over 2,700 people on our database, which made it more than, than um, statistically significant. And, um, uh, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis, yes, there are some men that were extremely um, strong in their decision-making uh, skills, etc. but as a group, no. They were average. I mean, the women were definitely above the mean on a consistent basis, particularly in business thinking. And why? I don't know. You know, I mean, I have, I have theories, obviously. Um, you know, I've spent all my career in business, and, and I've also spent a good part of my life where, oh, men and women are equal, men and women need to be equal. Being different does not mean you're not equal. I mean, you know, thank the Lord that we are not the same as men. You know, for all kinds of reasons, and for men too, thank the Lord that, that uh, you know, that there is a difference. And being different does not make you unequal. Being different means you figure out what capabilities you have that you can use to your best advantage. People often ask me, um, you know, did you use your femininity in business? I said, absolutely. You know, being tall and blonde and, yeah, short skirts. Now, and, <laughs> and high heels. Yeah, Mickey. Mickey needed high heels. Um, our ability to, uh, in, in, when I was first in business, obviously, was in the early, early days where very few women were, in, uh, wanting, were able to become executives. And John Malloy wrote the book on how women should dress, dark suits, white shirts, you know, little paisley ties, and I refused to. So I wore Armani and uh, always colorful until Mort Myerson, who was our president, he said, I think I have to send out an edict. I want everyone to dress like Alice. And it did. It makes a difference as to how you look, but every asset you have used to the fullest extent. Now, we're in a politically correct world, and you know, you're not supposed to say any, but wrong. Use every asset you have. <laughs> Another? Um, 
as a as a father of four children, I have two boys and two girls from 17 to 24, and trying to help them understand who they are and and, and what their passions are. And to your question, where do you fit? Um, you know, looking at various testings. Um, you know, the uh, Campbell Strong Inventory of Interest, the Johnson O'Connor Foundation, Myers Briggs, mm -hmm. and all those. I, and and also for people that are making career changes. I mean, I've done some of it myself uh, in transition. What, uh, I'd be interested to hear your comments and recommendations on, as I explained to my children, it's just information. Right. It, it helps you to better understand and you take that and you decide what to do with it as you go forward. But I'd be interested to hear your comments and maybe some recommendations on which of those you think are better and maybe some are better at a college age versus a, a career age. Uh, I mean, they're, they're all, you know, just an insight. If I had to give advice now, I would say that the, the most basic thing you have to be able to answer, whether you're 16 or whether you're 40 or whether you're 60, what makes you happy? Mm -hmm. Now, my entire life, I thought I really wanted to be in fashion. I mean, I love fashion and I love the arts. And I got an MBA and ended up at EDS and made money and, and stuff. And um, after I left EDS, I spent a year at Universal Studios as their chief technology office, or trying to help them understand why CDs were going to become obsolete. And I was really unhappy. My husband had already retired and said, we have enough money to where you can take a year off. Please take a year off and enjoy yourself and figure out what you want to do next. And so I did. And then he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to open a retail store. He went, ugh. <laughs> he said, why don't, you tr why don't you sell your corporate wardrobe on eBay? Because that'll give you a good retail experience. And I went out and bought a mannequin, and I took photographs, and I did all of that. And, he, and, and then he said, well, how about it? I said, I love fashion. I love the arts. I hate customers. <laughs> so he, he said, well. And so what I ended up doing instead is working with women business owners. They're all in fashion, they're all in the arts, and, uh, and, and you know what the most common complaint I hear from all of them? Those customers. I mean, there are customers they love, and then there are customers they don't love, but they spend thousands of dollars with them. <laughs> and so I've been fortunate enough to have the best of both worlds. But even as a young child, I mean, you, you know, if you can really figure out what makes you happy. And, and then at the end of the day, you know, figure out if you, you know, then go in that environment. Um, you know, a lot of people have aptitude for a lot of different things. And, and the tests sometimes, those are a little bit confusing. And so, I mean, just figure out what you re when you're really happy and you're like, oh. I mean, when I walk into New York, into a store, I'm really happy. <laughs> and, and so, that when it, you know, and that's really where we're fortunate enough to live in an environment where there are so many options. Now, I also have to say, you know, it also made me really, really happy to make money. And so my uh, years at EDS were challenging, you know, et cetera, but it set me up to be able to do what I'm doing now. But yes, I mean, you can't always have everything at the same time, but, uh, but being in an environment where every day you come home you absolutely hate is the other extreme. And then when you go, your kids go to college and they get into a program and they don't like it, let them change. Uh, I also, for kids, I really encourage them to either volunteer or internships, um, you know, just whatever way they can um, get experience and exposure. Because until you're inside the system, you really don't know. I mean, I was responsible, responsible for health care and insurance at EDS, but until I spent 96 days in the hospital with my husband, I got a totally different understanding of what health care is. Is there another question? Can you give us a few examples of some women in the workforce or in the politics that uh, share some of the characteristics that you talked about and how they fit into the four Ps? 
Um, yes. Now, I, I have to say my hero has always been Margaret Thatcher. Um, and she was prime minister when, when uh, I was, I mean, she, she was intensely disliked by the opposition, but she was extremely successful. Um, you know, it's, it's in today's environment, um, politics and the media have so colored what we see and hear about people. Uh, I was fortunate in that um, when I was at EDS, I had responsibility for health care, so I participated when Hillary, when Hillary Clinton was in the process of um, doing Hillary Care and got exposure to her. And um, I mean, she had politics down to a fine art. I mean, it was unbelievably how political she was and how sh she was able to use power. Now, I don't mean that in as a pejorative way as it's coming out, but in essence, um, I guess it was pejorative. You know, I think I look at, um, you know, people in today's world that I think I really, really appreciate and value, and um, they're not, you know, they're not the reality stars, whether it's in politics or whether it's in business, but they're teachers and nurses and, um, you know, they're, they're women who, you know, are just working extremely hard, doing a lot of things. And, and I also think it's really, really, it's not a negative that there are only 10 or 12 percent women that are in senior leadership because there are lots and lots and lots of women who have much happier and richer lives because they're doing what they want to do. Now, at some point, maybe that number will change. I don't know. There are a lot of women-owned businesses, but most of them, the majority, 70 to 80 percent, are one- and two-person businesses. So I don't have a silver um, ball to tell you what I think is going to happen, but I do say if you want to have a happy, full, rich life, figure out who you are and get yourself in a place where you can be that person. Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about the number of women in senior uh, leadership roles and, and uh, being happy and what it takes to get there, the number of women who make it to these places. What do you think of how the role of women as mothers and having children, you know, and, and those home roles that women tend to have more than men, how does that impact that? Uh, well, I want two things. One, uh, of the executive women that I got to personally know, um, I don't think there was one in that group that really, really was very, really happy in the role they were in. And in my generation there, it was this huge conflict in that you had to be everything. You had to be a super mom, you had to be, you know, you had to be, and you can't have everything. You may, you maybe you can have everything, but you can't have it at the same time. Uh, and I think it's just really, really good in today's environment where being a mother and raising children is again becoming something that is a super positive versus a negative. And, and you know, um, I have, uh, my husband and I, we have what we call chosen children, and I have four chosen daughters. They're not biologically uh, mine, but for different reasons they've become our, our daughters. And they're all taking different approaches as to when they have had their children and how they've dealt with it. One's been a single mom, which is very, very difficult. Uh, one is in a situation where she doesn't have to work. Another one is in a situation where she has to work, but has to work part time. But the men in their lives also are a critical piece of that puzzle in terms of making that happen. Now, one thing we started to do, um, and we don't have the rich enough database, but we started really looking or having uh, twenty somethings take the profile to see if there was going to be significant differences, and the. There, there, is a, there is a difference evolving that low, low, low self-esteem is not as low in subsequent generations. And I think it's because there, no, there just isn't the same influences that you're being hit with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's okay to be a mom. It's okay to be a successful businesswoman. 
you know, it's okay to be a, you know, be a lady who lunches. Um, you know, again, I think that's, that's a positive. But even if it weren't a positive, at the end of the day, it's your life. You know, it's your life and whether or not you're going to be happy is it is only a decision that you can make and, only a dis and the only person that can change that is you. And so many people, myself included, at different points in my life, wait for some grand thing to happen. Oh, I, you know, live in the, you live in the future 75% of the time and in the past 25% of the time, and you miss every single day. And that's my husband, bless his heart. You know, people say, do you ever get angry about what happens? And he goes, and he doesn't speak real well, have choice. Happy, mad, happy. That's a choice. Okay, are we out of time? Okay, well. Alice, thank you very much. I yeah. uh, really uh, enjoyed your talk. And on behalf of our uh, alumni board, I'd like to present you with this uh, glass sculpture that was uh, done by a local artist, uh, oh. Loretta Evie. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a, a great presentation from you again tomorrow you at the Women's Conference. Okay.